DBHDD is reminding people that the Georgia Crisis and Access Line can help those worried about opioid and stimulant misuse. The toll-free number is online and is active 24-7. More information at opioidresponse.info. The Biden administration has set a target for vaccinating at least 70 percent of Americans at least once by July 4th. With just days to go before that deadline, Georgia's vaccination rollout has been sluggish. As of late June, barely one out of three Georgians had been vaccinated, and rates are even lower for Georgians of color. Public health officials say that without urgent action, the state's at increased risk for future surges of COVID-19, especially due to the highly contagious Delta variant. Vice President Kamala Harris came to Georgia last month to urge holdouts to get vaccinated. We together have the power to end this pandemic. We know what the numbers tell us. We got to get those numbers up. I'm Steve Fennessy. For this episode of Georgia Today, I'm joined by Grant Blankenship from Georgia Public Broadcasting's Macon Bureau. Grant's been following the state's COVID-19 vaccination campaign. So Grant, we're now six months into the most ambitious vaccination campaign that America has seen probably since the campaign to eradicate polio back in the 1950s. What is it about Georgia specifically that is making for such a sluggish rollout of the vaccination campaign? If you look at the electoral map from the 2020 presidential election, counties that went majority Republican tend to be less vaccinated than counties that went majority Democrat. That's a tight correlation that really works its way out across the country. It's not just Georgia. There's also mistrust on the part of lots of people of color of of the medical establishment. I would just need them to prove it to me that it's 100 percent effective. Andre Felder Jr. was in the audience for Harris, unvaccinated and still skeptical. Also in my community, in the black community growing up, I was always taught vaccinations and medicine isn't always the best for us. They don't, the government doesn't usually do the best things for us per se. Felder told me he does eventually expect to get the vaccine. But as of now, he's among the 58% of Georgians eligible for the vaccine who haven't gotten it yet. And so there's a lot of wait and see on the part of people um, around the state. When statistically we know that you know, getting COVID is way more dangerous than being vaccinated against it, even given what we know about side effects of the vaccines. And now we're starting to come up against an especially virulent variant of coronavirus, the Delta variant, highly transmissible. The CDC says about 20 percent of the new cases come from the Delta variant nationwide. Georgia with 20 active cases. South Carolina has four. And the sense of urgency then is even more acute, or at least it should be, in terms of getting people vaccinated, because the vaccine does provide protection against the variant as well. Vice President Kamala Harris came to Georgia to um, drum up interest in the vaccination campaign. And that same week, Governor Kemp announced that they were going to roll out, I think, 370 or so mobile units around the state in advance of the July 4th deadline. But at the same time, he declined an allotment of something like 3 million doses of vaccine. So what's going on there? Letting demand lead supply really is the situation all the states are in at this point. And if there's no demonstrated demand for the vaccine, then yeah, the feds are going to take it elsewhere. They're going to they're going to ship it where there is demand. There's a shelf life to these vaccines saying you'll take it, but they don't use it, then they can just go to waste. You can only store it for so long before it's it's no good anymore. And if you've got somewhere where it's flying off the shelves, send it there. And if you compare its efforts to roll out the the vaccination campaign in Georgia and compare it to other states, how involved is the State Department of Health? Well, so there's two different sort of streams of vaccine delivery to providers in the state. One of those is purely federal. So that's your pharmacies, doctor's offices. Those are the places that the State Department of Public Health really doesn't have any say over. Mass vaccination sites, those were federally supplied and not supplied by the state allocations. State public health has some say over how much vaccine your local health department is going to get. We're looking at states around the country and the, the rate of vaccination has varied and fluctuated pretty wildly if you compare some states to others. 
Experts call it a tale of two COVID nations. In much of the Northeast and West, where vaccination rates are higher, cases are falling. But in much of the South, where vaccinations are at their lowest, cases are once again surging. In Missouri, they're up 72 percent. There are some states that have pretty high vaccination rate now. And those, of course, have red counties. You know, they have residents of color. What is it about states within the South that seems to engender an especially stubborn type of resistance to getting the vaccine? There's access, there's politics on either ends of the Southern political spectrum, either very liberal or very conservative. So in Northwest Georgia, those deeply red counties just aren't digging into that supply. I think you have massive distrust today of the political establishment. At the pace that Georgia is moving, it could be months, maybe even stretching into the third year of the pandemic before Georgia hits that goal. The politics can be a distraction, says CDC Director Rochelle Walensky. But I would say that the reason to get vaccinated is a very individual decision, not a political decision. And so that's really what we're trying to do and is bring that decision to individual people. The CDC says nationwide, 65 percent of those eligible have had at least one vaccine. But in Georgia, that rate is only 42 percent. State data shows only two Georgia counties, Fayette and Oconee, have vaccination rates exceeding 50 percent. And I think it's important to put this in context because this is is such a fast-moving thing. I mean, we've only had vaccines for about six months, and that's not a long time. But when we first started launching the vaccination campaign in Georgia, they were opening up Mercedes-Benz because they imagined that There would be thousands of people flocking to get a vaccine, and they would need these huge capacity events to give shots to all of them. How did those pan out? Mercedes-Benz, I think, was a success. But some of the others around the state, particularly in Albany, so, you know, Albany was this early hotspot. So when the state dropped a mass vaccination site in Albany, it blew my mind when people just were not coming out to that mass vaccination site. Getting the word out about a pop-up vaccination site nearby is one thing. Dispelling suspicions is another. In this small rural city, three hours southwest of Atlanta. Nearly three quarters of the population is African American. Many living in poor and underserved communities. We know that years ago, uh, there were horrible experiments that were done on African American community. So African Americans have had a very well-founded distrust of the medical community. I think the the real challenge in this is it's the assumption that just because it's there, people are going to want it. The piece that's sort of been missing in this is really giving people the knowledge they need to understand why they need it so that they show up and get vaccinated. In talking to Margaret Harrow, she's the leader of the Georgia mobile vaccination effort on the part of CORE, this disaster aid group based in California that DPH is collaborating with. They were hand in hand with the Navajo Nation during their COVID vaccination effort, which is one of the most successful COVID vaccination efforts in the country. They've hit and surpassed President Biden's goal. And so now DPH has looked at CORE and said, y'all are very, very good at logistics and finding the the most vulnerable pockets of a community and going there to do these vaccinations. And so that's now CORE's job. They are the specialists for the state at this point. Harrow says once DPH and CORE came to an agreement, some health districts were quick to ask for help. Waycross right away said, hey, we want you to come down here and help us. You know, some of the local DPH units were the first to reach out. Since then, CORE has had a steady presence in rural South Georgia. But other health districts and communities have not been so eager. They haven't even contacted us, and I don't think they will. For instance, CORE has almost no footprint in northwest Georgia, despite low vaccination rates there. The same is true around Augusta. They're working more in southwest Georgia in urban areas where there's high Latino and black population because we know about the disparate impact of COVID in Latino and black communities. Phoebe Health is the largest vaccinator in Doherty County, which includes Albany. Hospital health officials say white people are being vaccinated at more than twice the rate of black residents. Dr. Hurd says a lack of access and trust both play a role. COVID-19 is still ravaging our community. We're bearing the brunt of this disease. Stay with us. 
Next on Georgia Today, what it might take to persuade unvaccinated Georgians to get their shots. I'm Steve Fennessy. DBHDD is reminding Georgians to ask their doctor about alternatives to opioid pain medication. Alternatives such as over-the-counter medications and physical therapy can be used to manage pain. More information at opioidresponse.info. This is Georgia Today. I'm Steve Fennessy. Grant Blankenship, a reporter for Georgia Public Broadcasting's Macon Bureau, has reported extensively on Georgia's vaccination campaign. He joins me now. As these vaccination campaigns have unfurled in in states across the country, different governors have tried different things to get people vaccinated. I know in Ohio they have lotteries. In California they have lotteries. Oftentimes the, the governor has definitely used the bully pulpit to get out there. What has Governor Kemp been doing to sort of sell Georgians on the necessity to get vaccinated? Until about mid-June, um, it had been weeks and weeks since we'd heard the governor on this issue at all. Kemp toured a, a core site at the uh, Latin American Association. More than 900,000 confirmed cases in our state, and it comes as Governor Brian Kemp gets a firsthand look at our state's vaccination efforts. He's making a special push to get shots in the arms of our Latino community. Right now, only 36% of Georgians are fully vaccinated. Our state ranks in the bottom seven in vaccination rates. But before that press conference, it had been quite some time since we'd heard anything about vaccinations um, from the governor. So I mean, he's, he's definitely not out here every day spreading the message. It's just strange because, you know, in, in the first months of the pandemic, you know, we saw Governor Kemp, we saw Kathleen Toomey, the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Health. You know, they were out at the Capitol in front of the cameras, you know, every week or so, if not more, giving updates. And then now we have this vaccine, which is the thing <laughs> that will end the pandemic. And you don't see them anywhere near as much as you did then. I don't know. I'm not going to draw a causal link here, but at the same time, our vaccination rates, not only are they lagging, like they've essentially stalled out in this period when we're not hearing anything from the state on the regular. Well, when you do ask him about it, he doesn't hesitate to agree with you that people should partake. In an attempt to boost vaccination rates, Governor Brian Kemp and Dr. Kathleen Toomey said they are prepared to handle any outbreak especially with growing concerns of the new highly contagious Delta variant of the virus. Literally one dose at the time now, and that is really the approach that it's going to take, I think, for the uh, the rest of the pandemic. It's difficult to, to look at how this is being tackled and not remember that there's an election next year, that the governor is trying very, very hard to get back in the good graces of some sort of dyed-in-the-wool very conservative folks who are not very happy with him about the way the election went down last year. And a lot of those folks are also very much of the, I have a freedom to either be vaccinated or not be vaccinated. It does seem that the Delta variant being much more highly transmissible than the coronavirus that we first encountered over a year ago is such that it's going to seed itself in communities where there is not a deep reservoir of vaccinated people. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the fear that by not vaccinating any any more quickly, that we're just setting ourselves up for trouble with the Delta variant. The Delta variant, the same variant blamed for the catastrophic surge of COVID cases and deaths in India, is quickly becoming more prominent in the U.S. What's more, medical experts say just about all those hospitalized share something in common. What percentage do you think it is of people you have now who are unvaccinated? It's nearly 100% of the people hospitalized with COVID pneumonia are unvaccinated. But something else to consider, Joshua White at Georgia Tech has a tool that lets you play around with various levels of this community infection plus vaccination model to get an idea of, of where we are in Georgia in terms of community immunity. Based on how many people have been sick in the state in the past, plus our vaccination rate, we're between, we're above 50% community immunity to the virus, right? So that being said, there's some suggestion that the Delta variant makes younger people sicker. 
In Arkansas, where only a third of eligible people have been fully vaccinated, the number of COVID patients in ICUs has more than doubled in the last few months. The sickest people now in their 20s and 30s. Now it's young, healthy individuals who are coming in needing mechanical ventilation, needing heart-lung bypass to stay alive. You know, when I'm out and about now, it feels like the before times, you know. Occasionally you'll see some masks um, in, in shops and such and in restaurants. But for the most part, I mean, people have resumed what appears to be their normal life. And, and yet we have this sort of specter of this new variant that's kind of like on the horizon. And so to what degree are, are, you know, local public health officials, local physicians, local emergency room doctors, how concerned are they about what might be coming? Because it does feel a little bit like, I don't know, like <laughs> this ain't over yet. You know, I've spoken to Amber Schmidtke, who used to work at the CDC. She's very worried about the Delta variant causing a, a spike later in the summer. Carlos Del Rio from Emory told me the same. Um, and you have to remember, we did have a spike last summer. The following winter was the worst we've seen of it. We seem to have a tough time when it got hot enough here that people were driven back indoors. But, you know, as we get deeper into the into the dog days, you know, I worry that that's when the stuff is going to spread around. We have the vaccine hesitant and then we have the vaccine opposers, you know, and trying to figure out what's the best way that's been found to sort of bring the hesitant around to getting vaccinated, knowing that those who are sort of opposed for whatever reason, political, religious, whatever, scientific, whatever their reason is, yeah, those are the ones we can't waste our time on. But there are those who are convertible. How do we identify them and sort of how do we bring them around? People are trying to answer that question as we're trying to implement the answer. That's really the problem. And yet having that answer is so vitally important. That being said, the common sense approach that you'll hear a lot of the time is it's important to find trusted members of the community, people that, that are listened to. You know, often that'll be preachers, pastors, politicians. When I've talked to people, it's not so much hesitancy. It's, it's just access. There's more of that I've encountered than planting your feet and saying, there's no way I'm ever going to do it. Let's take the, the demographic of, of kids between 12 and 15, right? So lots of people were very, very excited when you're, you can get your middle school kid vaccinated. In Georgia, that has stalled out at about 14% of that demographic that has been vaccinated. And if you look at the map of things, it's two or three counties away to find the vaccine that their kids can use. And to specify... There's just one of the three vaccines that have so far been given emergency youth authorization. Exactly. That's the Pfizer vaccine. And it's also the one that is hardest to store. So DPH will tell you it's not been given to a lot of rural health districts because they didn't have the physical infrastructure, the freezers, like the deep freeze to keep the stuff on hand. The life-saving vials must be kept at minus 94 degrees. Once out of the shipping containers within 90 seconds, the vaccine needs to be moved into special freezers or put into a standard refrigerator to thaw where it can stay for up to five days. This is the most acute public health emergency in, in 100 years. Tonight, the U.S. is about to hit a once unimaginable milestone in the COVID pandemic, 600,000 deaths. With nearly 600,000 deaths, there's more COVID trouble ahead. The Delta variant is now taking hold in the U.S. and doubling every two weeks. It's the most contagious variant yet, even infecting those who are partially vaccinated. It's probably going to become the dominant strain here in the United States. I think the risk is really to the fall that this could spike a new epidemic. It would just seem that every single political elected official would be out on the hustings singing the necessity for this miracle vaccine, which can keep this at bay. There have been more than 20,000 Georgians who have died of COVID. That's not an insignificant number. It is a huge number. And also place it in the context of other types of death that were, were exercised about. Here in Macon, where I live, we've had 60, roughly 60 gun homicides over the course of the pandemic, an astronomical number for us. 
people. We're going to have community meetings about it. We're going to talk about it as, as a community, how we're going to stop this stuff. We're not doing that about COVID. And those are the things that make me scratch my head. We know exactly what we need to do to stop it. And we're just not doing it. My thanks to GPB's Grant Blankenship. This week, Governor Brian Kemp asked lawmakers to weigh in on where to spend nearly $5 billion in federal coronavirus relief aid. The funds are aimed at helping government agencies, nonprofits, and businesses recoup some of their pandemic expenses. Kemp is expected to announce the funding allocations this fall. For more Georgia Today, go to gpb.org. I'm Steve Fennessy. Georgia Today is a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Subscribe to our show anywhere you get podcasts. Don't forget to leave us a rating and review on Apple. Jess Mador produced this episode. Georgia Today's engineers are Jesse Neiswanger and Jahi Whitehead. Thanks for listening. See you next week.